Our time on this planet is a journey of introspection. Given that, there may well come a moment in an individual man's life when he is compelled to, for the first time, distance himself from the beasts of the forest. To indeed rise, stand up on two legs, and walk bipedally, haltingly staggering into a bright future of previously unknown experiences. Such new experiences may, as time progresses, manifest themselves through adaptation of social order, along with a desire to cast aside previously held skepticism regarding modern societal graces. I myself undertook such a journey recently when, by way of much cajoling by my dear wife, I accepted that the time had come for our family to discontinue the rather primitive and outmoded manner of eating directly off the ground, and instead take our meals on a traditional eating surface where our food would be served on white bone china, and we would clean our faces not with our sleeves, but with crisp linen napkins, a rebirth, you might say, from our primitive past. In what manner should this table be constructed, I asked? To what historical genre should the architectural lines pay homage? What type of dead tree carcass would please you the most? I don't care about any of those details. I'm sure you can come up with something nice, my wife replied. I just want something that isn't too big normally, but can seat 12 to 14 people when needed. Maybe we need two identical tables that we could just push together, she asked. And thus, a brave idea was born, and the laborer, his spirits lifted, began a months-long journey, toiling away in solitude. Despite my assurances to my wife that I indeed did have a plan for our new dining room table, I didn't have a plan for our new dining room table. What I did know is that I wanted something substantial. I wanted something with a heavy, solid base. I don't care for dining room tables that have spindly, flimsy legs that allow the table to move or rock. I can't stand that. To that end, my material choice is eight-quarter solid maple. Stuff is really heavy. My initial plan was to build two table pedestals, which would in turn support the top between them. However, after putting together one of them, I just didn't care for the way it looked. So I decided to scrap the two pedestals and just build one much longer table base with two sets of outriggers for stability. began gluing together slabs of maple. Lots of slabs of maple. I needed a table base that was going to be almost five feet long. I guess that's about 1500 millipedes or whatever for your metric types.
for the first time building this table, I actually had to go out and buy some six foot long pieces of pipe for my pipe clamp. The longest I had on hand was four foot. The table base is going to get four outriggers that provide lateral stability and keep the thing from tipping over. That's what these pieces here are for. Leg pieces required quite a bit of hand planing to get everything down to the correct thickness. Although, admittedly, I used a power plane where it made sense to do so because it saved a little bit of time. These were all too wide to fit through my regular thickness planer. Using a series of bezier curves, I laid out a pattern on brown craft paper that was equivalent to the height of what the table base would be when it was finished, which is 26 inches. I could then cut out the paper template to later affix to a piece of MDF so that I could build a router template for shaping the table legs. After the MDF template was cut out, I could do some rough shaping with a spoke shave and it was at that point that I figured out that spoke shaves really do not work very well on what is essentially end grain MDF. They're fantastic for other tasks, but on MDF, not so much. I squared up the template on each of the leg blanks and drew layout lines. Now a word about waste. I had originally glued these leg blanks together at a fixed width without a clear idea in mind of what my shape was going to look like. And as it turned out, I ended up cutting away quite a bit of the material because of the shape I chose. And you know, that's, that's a bit wasteful. The reality is that where you see me drawing out there on the line didn't need to be glued to this blank. Now this material won't go to waste, I'll cut it off and use it for something else, but you know, it would have made a lot more sense for me to glue on a very short piece here at the bottom and saved all of that material above it. On the backs of each of the four outrigger legs, I marked three different locations along the length for dowel pins and determine what the center point was in each leg and drill holes for three quarter inch dowels. On the bottom of each leg, I figured out the center point and marked the location for a hole that would be drilled so that I could install some furniture leveling feet. I originally started to drill these holes with a regular spade bit, but against end grain, that spade bit was dancing all over the place. So I switched over to a pretty aggressively toothed hole saw, and thinking that it would not have a tendency to drift so much on the end grain, and it worked fine. Once I had the whole outline cut, then I just hogged out the center of it with a straight cutting bit and my router.
The largest section of the base was entirely too large to fit on the bed of my bandsaw, so I just rough cut these shapes with a jigsaw. The leg outriggers were small enough to be cut on the bandsaw. Each table leg outrigger comes in 15 inches from the outside corner. And after squaring the leg up, I drew a pencil line down one side and then another pencil line down the other. And that left me with a set of parallel lines that I could use to drill the holes that would later accept some dowels. These are two and a quarter inches thick, two and a quarter inches long, three quarters of an inch thick. These dowels are an extremely tight fit in their hole to give the air and glue a place to go when they're driven in. I drilled a hole down the center of each one. Finalizing the leg shape was done on a router table with a pattern cutting bit. I had to use a combination of climb cuts and regular cuts to keep the wood from splintering because I was changing directions multiple times with the grain. I ended up moving the position of this. I think it was too close to the end of the foot and I actually had one of these break off and separate right at that joint line. So I filled this with a dowel and then cut a plug to fit over the top of it that fit exactly and then just trimmed it off flush. And instead of having it right here I'm going to move the foot back further on it to give me a little bit more you know thickness here where I'm not way out at the end of this foot. As you can see there, I moved the foot leveling position holes back further to get back into the meat of the leg rather than being right out on the edge. As I was bringing these legs from the basement up to the garage, I bumped one of them into a door frame and snapped that foot right off. And it broke right at the point where the hole was drilled. So I had concerns about the longevity of this if I left those where they were. And then it was on to sanding. Everybody's favorite job, certainly my favorite job, the thing that I look forward to the most in any project. Working through the grit, randomly moving the orbit sander around, checking to make sure you've cleaned up all of the surface imperfections. It's just fabulous. I love it so much as I'm sure you do as well. Many unbearable hours later. Uh. When I 
originally cut out the blanks for these legs, I sized them to 30 inches. A typical dining room table sits about 30 inches off the floor. And I hadn't had an idea in mind at that point of what the table aprons were going to look like. But after building the base, I had an idea of that formulated in my head, so I knew what the overall height needed to be, which was 26 inches. So I cut each of the table leg blanks down to their final size. My little battery powered skill saw there just doesn't have quite the cutting depth to go all the way through that material, so I had to finish it up with a handsaw. No biggie. Now the foot breaking off earlier had gotten me kind of spooked. You know, I just had envisions of somebody pulling a chair up or in or out of the table and knocking into one of those legs and breaking it off. So rather than risking that happen and having to do a repair later, I decided I would reinforce each of the legs with an inset spline. And to cut that spline, I just routed a groove down the center of each foot and inlaid a piece of maple that would function as you know, a stabilizer. It was about 35 degrees outside on the day of this glue up, so I had to bring everything inside so it would dry. I just didn't think the glue was going to set up with it being that cold outside. I definitely should have clamped these when gluing them up. I thought the friction fit was going to be sufficient, but I left a small gap at the bottom of the spline. That was visible on the foot. It wasn't probably a big deal, but it was going to bug me. So I just took a piece of maple that was the same material as I cut the splines with, so the width was correct, and just chiseled off a chunk of it into a wedge shape. I could then apply a small amount of glue, get it seated down in the hole properly, and drive it home with a hammer. That would allow me to fill the gap without having to resort to using wood putty. I, I try to avoid using wood putty or other kinds of fillers like that if at all possible. I prefer to make fixes in wood with actual wood. It's so pretty.
glue up required just a bit of clamp fudgery to make sure everything lined up nice and square. Hey, if you stuck through to this point, thank you. Appreciate you watching. I will have part two coming soon, the table aprons. There's some interesting things that'll be part of that video, so I hope you'll join me on the next one.